Oh yeah. It seems like something like in the 2000s they'd put like uh, like a Carl Sagan speech over, <laughs> like and people would be like, oh my god, it's beats with a speech. Beats with a speech is beats my new and podcast. Beats speech is great. <laughs> and everybody would, be, would be on like Boing Boing. Oh yeah. Uh, Carl Sagan. The eviscerates brew, like you've never heard from the grave. Yeah, exactly. It's got to be from the grave. From well, so, that's where it all comes from. Apparently, Elon Musk is now Twitter's largest shareholder. Nine point eight percent. Nine point eight. Nine point two. Nobody else. Dorsey has like two point five percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Series of CEOs. So. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm just yeah, just just putting the number out there for so people know. But yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the the largest shareholder, which uh, we were talking before we went live uh well i mean do we want to save this for the show or is this a yeah, conversation we can talk about the it on show? the show yeah let's just save yeah, it for the a, show this is good content okay, cool uh, I, I have more to say about this than <laughs> than a lab leak theory that's for sure yeah <laughs> you see the vanity fair article price the one that you sent yeah uh uh n- no i <laughs> didn't uh, 18 million people dead most important controversy of her time don't have time for it it's <laughs> it is a moving target, yeah, and yeah, all, yeah. every time hey, I know. Hey, so many, hey. they're so they're like, oh, Andrew, what, Andrew, what's your position of malaria vaccination in Africa? I'd be like, it's good. <laughs> so I'm you just know, sorry. No, was, you're not. Look, he says he likes to play coy on this, though, Andrew. And the next thing you know, he goes right back home, uh, 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 selects his zoonotic origins uh, rap in Forza, and it's just. <laughs> It's <laughs> hogging the curves. Listen, man, the cup noodle Corvette moves, baby. <laughs> the cup noodle Corvette has got speed. Cup of noodles sent me a whole package once of stuff because, like, I mentioned them on. As you were talking on Twitter. Oh, oh really? by the way, I actually have a, a, a very quick story. Nothing, nothing moves mountains faster than a blue check mark complaining to a corporate account on twitter like it yeah. is it is the like the closest i'll ever be to the succession like <laughs> characters is when like i i try to live like a plebeian and go through the appropriate channels which i do mm. and then if that yields no results i will go on twitter and say excuse me i'm having mild discomfort and watch <laughs> everything avalanche immediately uh, uh mm-hmm. to my benefit i which, want I... Which, which by the way in this case was me sending a frame bridge order to a wrong in fact non-existent address trying to uh, figure out how to complete uh, how to correct that them not answering and then me saying i sent the thing to the wrong address and getting a rush mailed version another thing wow sent directly to my house blue checks man they're the best disgusting <laughs> oh okay uh, mr yeah, swimming we, in red vines and <laughs> cup of noodles <laughs> oh and we literally last week i was uh roshni bought me an arby's gift card for my mm. for christmas and it didn't get delivered and she said <gasps> something on twitter to them no response so i just put in the comments <laughs> and this was meant for me uh-huh. like this was meant for me <laughs> Boom! Arby solved it. The wow. new, the new, the you. new owner of an Arby's franchise. <laughs> yeah. It's disgusting. Rush. I partake in this. Of course, I, I, of course. <laughs> Meat Mountain. Uh, who among us wouldn't? I need to talk to Jeff, who runs our Modern Road website, and see if we can get like uh, the crew listed on that website because that's how a lot of mm. Twitter's verification stuff is. You just have to prove a website you're says you're part of, part of something. Thing. Yeah. yeah. A lot of them just had deals directly with the media outlets. Well, yeah. Well, I don't have Jack. Jack at twitter.com is bouncing back. So I need to find the new right, Jack to Jack talk to Twitter. It. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's do the show. Uh, everybody good to start the show. Let's go. Yep. All right. Let's go in three, <clears throat> two. Hello and welcome to the weird things podcast. I'm Andrew Main joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. Uh, gentlemen, first off, NASA is trying to do a basically what's called like a, uh, I guess, a wet dress rehearsal with the SLS rocket. This is the big, humongous rocket that's been in development for several years and a big part of their plans for space exploration. Um, and 
I'll just report it straightforward without our commentary on the necessity of this and the cost on it. Uh, they had to scrub it yesterday. And what a wet dress rehearsal is, they actually pump it full of fuel. They're like, hey, there's a leak. We got to fix that. And so they had some sort of pressurization problem yesterday. I think that they, they're they trying again today. And I don't have an update as far as when that was going to work or not. And there was also a little bit of a deal about like how NASA was like, wasn't going to announce the actual time that they were doing this. And people were like, why is this? And like, oh, it's ITAR, it's secret. And it's like, we did that for the shuttle and like every other single launch. So anyhow, um, we'll see. I think we'll hopefully it'll, everything will work off right. And the SLS has had a number of problems. And one of the things that got brought up too, somebody pointed out is this launch tower, okay? SLS was supposed to be, hey, we'll reuse space shuttle parts, things like this, and build this rocket. But that, you know, whenever government tries to be frugal, the opposite happens, and it ends up being extremely expensive. And that launch tower alone costs something like a billion dollars. And there has Ooh. been a comparison between that and, like, what SpaceX spends, which was something like, you know, $80 million to build something like that. So, mm. uh, oh, no. so, so yeah, this is the Artemis. Right, this is the, the the Artemis uh, project, which will be program, us yeah. landing on the moon for the first time since the last time we landed on the moon. Right. Well, yeah, part of this this will actually the SLS is going to have its as a, an Orion mission, which is one. As I believe they're going to do a mission where they're going to send a capsule around the moon okay. and back, the Orion capsule, and then leading up to Artemis, which is going to be using that to send that that capsule up, which would then rendezvous with the SpaceX lander in that and they've actually nasa has budget has been receiving pretty much what it's been asking for they actually got the budget for a second lunar landing with spacex so oh, wow it's just the crazy part is they're using this like one to two billion dollar launch vehicle to send the astronauts up to basically what hopefully if it works you know meet up with a totally reusable rocket that could actually carry them to there but I mean, jeez, uh, I, I feel like this is one of our old hobby horses. Uh, uh, the 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 idea of, I mean, because because here's the thing: we were on this when it was a news story, right? We were we were on we were on the SLS <laughs> being a bad idea, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> what eight years ago? <laughs> like, I mean, it, it it is it has been a minute. Uh, uh, the the fact that this has indeed. Uh, uh, transpired exactly as we'd foreseen uh, uh, with every cost overrun, every, I mean, the fact that it was outdated at the time that it was proposed and has only gotten more outdated since, you know, that it was, it was outdated in a, in a, a more grounded expectation of what SpaceX would be able to do in that intervening time period. Not only has it taken longer, but SpaceX has gone above and beyond expectations of what they have been able to do. Um, I think it says everything you need to know about our modern relationship between the SLS, which effectively for those who are just tuning in is a conglomeration of the biggest uh, uh, defense contractors and space contractors that there are. Uh, the, the, the fact that it was a, a progressive and revolutionary step to allow SpaceX to just do a small part of what they could very easily and have all but demonstrated do totally by themselves for a far cheaper price. The fact that that's progressive shows you where we are in this, in this process, but to be fair, moving in the right direction. So uh, mm -hmm. we are, we are happy about that. And also we don't, we don't want to, you know, uh, uh, wish ill on, on anything, especially something that's taken as much time mm -hmm. and, and spend uh, as much money on it as this. And Starship is unproven. Starship has not gone into, <clears throat> into orbit yet, and we don't know that it's going to work, and we do want to have multiple launch capacities. Don't really want to, like, the price tag, and we need to address how these things are paid for, but right. there is n waiting for this thing to work that may not work, may not be the best strategy. And, and just to... And, like, Im imagine the blunder of the decade it would be if the opposite happened, where we put all of our eggs in the SpaceX basket, and then... X doesn't work, yeah, it bad like PR. Really... It, I mean, like, it, they, there's a lot of unknowns where at least having, uh, I mean, it is expensive. I, it was overly would, expensive, but. I would say, though, at this point, it would have been the smarter bet because of proven track record well, and success of the Falcon 9 now by, like, you'd be like, well, who who should you bet on? The You know, the contractors that, mm -hmm. you know, haven't built a new vehicle in 20 years. Sure. Uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, hindsight, obviously, is 
is is a lot clearer. Yeah. But but at the time, you, I I think I understand the trepidation of yeah. of of yeah. leaning on out even just outside contractors for what is still groundbreaking technology. Yeah, and it's been. SpaceX has sort of been the outlier. We're still waiting for Blue Origin to deliver its engines and for their other, you know, the Vulcan rocket, which is, you know, wants to do a lot of expensive, fancy payloads, is dependent upon that. And we've seen, like, SpaceX may be the anomaly right now, but there are a lot of other encouraging companies out there. And I will I will defend the defense industry in a lot of this because sometimes we apply very sinister motives to stuff. But imagine you're a person who's in charge of, like, assigning resources to, to projects, and you notice that... If you put 28 engineering product managers on one project and it makes a billion, you put, let's, how many did I say, 20 of them in there and it makes a billion, and, and you have a billion in profit you make from it. But this other one where you put 40 engineering product managers and it made $300 million, you'd be like, oh, well, I should use fewer because we made more money. But in reality, those were the ones making sure that each component got delivered and got done. And that other project that made more money was delayed by three years or took much longer by three years. It didn't deliver what the government wanted, but the net amount you made was more. You're not making an evil decision there. You're not saying, I'm going to screw the government over. You're looking to this going, "What's he, how did this make money? How did this make, oh, this is the structure for that. The consideration that because of cost plus and the way these things work with government contracting isn't as important to you. And so you can be a very sincere person and you can design a system that absolutely games the system, which yeah. is what happens in the defense industry. I, and that, yeah, I, 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 whenever you are making a critique about the military industrial complex, I think that there is this idea of, you know, it gets wrapped into these notions, these political notions of like, oh, well, we're pushing war so we can sell bombs and blah, blah, blah. Like there's this idea of, uh, of, you know, a darkness surrounding it when, and look, we've got a bunch of people that are in our community that work for a lot of these companies <laughs> and make, mm -hmm. and make good livings doing it. And when you talk to them about what their lives, what, what their, what their jobs are, it's a bunch of very earnest by and large, hardworking people who work in a de facto for profit government bureaucracy. Like they, they work yeah. almost exclusively with, either our government or in limited capacity, other governments, uh, that means they are just kind of almost fully integrated. You know, they, they, they are, they're going, they're getting money and building things to spec at certain, uh, 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 at certain, you know, rules and regulations that mean that they have a similar structure and it just takes and forever. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the thing is it's not bad. It just takes forever because that's how they're built. And, and there are, you know, I'm sure there any any Wahoo can make a private military contractor, but uh, I don't think he's around since the, the since they are named the Guardians. Oh Jesus! Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, in terms of like, you know, when the government does stuff, especially when it comes to defense, they have to have very they tend to have pretty high tolerances or very specific tolerances for the things that they need and there are only so many companies that can do that to that scale i uh, imagine that, that's part of it that also becomes an excuse to charge even more and why you had the military paying 600 dollars for toilet seats and stuff because they use that as an excuse to say and but you're right they're, they're do have, they do have to in a lot of times too they have to make things in limited quantities but we've seen via SpaceX and some of these other smaller companies, the defense contractors are grossly inefficient in the way that they do a lot of stuff and not out of malice. And mm -hmm. so, you know, another consideration too is like, I was I was baffled by like the really, some of the really bad early analysis of the Russian invasion of Ukraine about the predictions that it was going to fall so quickly, et cetera. And reading analyst reports from people who were paid to analyze this you know, the thing that's being clear to me is like, these people aren't dumb. They're smarter than I am. They know this much better than I do. But their job, and maybe whether they implicitly realize it or not, is there's not a lot of money in writing defense reports for defense contractors in the Pentagon if all you do is underestimate the Russian and the Chinese yeah. military. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. Your your job is to, <laughs> to, it, to it, prepare it, it, for it's every just, contingency. Yeah, it's that like, is a, oh, Russia, well, every. fart noise. Like, <laughs> eh, whatever.
Yeah, you're not you have not every, but just you just you can get money by saying, well, if Russia has this hypersonic cruise missile, that's a problem. The fact that well, they could probably only make three and it may not work isn't as relevant because Raytheon's like, yeah, we need a five billion dollar contract to build a hypersonic cruise missile defense screen. So just come up with a report that shows that Russia's working on this, whatever, and it could be a threat. And you're like, okay, you do that. Now, is it whatever? I don't really don't. I really don't know. I have no clue there. And that was with Ukraine. Was nobody was really trying to look into like. Although Ukrainian military had been speaking to uh, American military forces, and at that level, there was a lot of talk, and there was a lot of people aware of logistics. At the higher level, that wasn't happening. They were aware. They were going by what's on paper and by the analysts that sort of are incentivized to, you know— Minimize one thing, exaggerate something else. Yeah, you know, it, it reminds me of, of a story that used to be one of those hyperbolic uh, a scare tactic kind of stories that would happen every few years that thankfully have kind of fallen out of favor, at least that I've seen, uh, which was the like the leaked secret Pentagon uh, uh, a plan on how the U.S. would invade China. <laughs> and it's like, it was real. It was yeah, a real thing. I'm sure. Because someone has to think that. Yeah. It, we should. Like, like that, like, like if we go to war with China, someone's like, ah, what? Get, back, get a map. We get a map. <laughs> exactly. You have to be prepared for You should. You we, should have a plan at least. When you have a fancy building with its own <laughs> name, like you need to be thinking of these things to justify your fancy building. Yeah. Uh uh, uh but but yeah, I think what the the idea being that you always want to be in a situation where you can understand uh, the worst case scenario. Now, how that then gets filtered through experts that talk to the media and and you know it, having you know for the for the politics show, I, I have to watch a lot of Sunday chat show politics chat show content. Oh, I'm sorry for which um, you know. Now that we're in this very weird phase of the war in Ukraine is a lot of military analysts making informed guesses. <laughs> like I I'm willing to say I make uninformed guesses <laughs> guesses on what's happening. They're making informed guesses. I know enough about war reporting that who knows, you know, like uh, even 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 as as we're looking at it right now there's no war reporting effectively is trusting either military on what they're telling you hilariously unreliable and trying to suss out immediate rumors. Also among the most unreliable things that happen in the entire world of journalism. Right. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It, it is, it is a, a weird, a weird thing, but I, I can understand where all of it incentivizes is to get back to your point, Andrew, the idea of you want to write the the steel man pitch for every possible threat uh, as opposed to the like i don't know i think they kind of suck and they're bad and and they're and they're <laughs> pretending to be more than they are and you know when the price tag is so high uh you're going to get you're going to get the best salesman using the best salesman techniques that they can to mm-hmm. do the you know it's do the do to do the do that's right you know, one more point on that too, and something that's been made by a couple of people in threads is that they'll show an example of, uh, you know, a, a piece of U.S. Heart heavy artillery during Vietnam, and then they'll show you a piece of Russian heavy artillery, and they're like, "What's the difference?" And you're like, "I don't know, like the color scheme, where it is." And they're like, "Well, look at the ammo for the U.S. artillery. It's stacked on top of a crate, and it's elevated off of the ground." The Russian stuff is just thrown on like a tarp or something like this. <laughs> and there's a video, which is horrific, which is you show somebody, somebody's opened up the back of a Russian ammo truck and all these landmines just start spilling out <gasps> because they don't Russian logistics at whole. They're not, not into crates, not into warehouses. And that's not in the military because they're always, we'll just have people carry them from point A to point B. So containerization, all these other little things. These are invisible to people who maybe aren't aware of blue collar things who don't when, you know, people visualize how does a warehouse work? Like, oh, well, here's a box of the items here and here's a thing here. I'm like, there's a lot more steps there. And if you miss those steps, you're basically doing it the same way the Babylonians did it. And that's part of the thing is like we're what we're cognitively not aware of. And and I I can point out, ah, these people don't notice. I'm like, yeah, like how how do I not? What, how does the world, what are things that make the world work that I don't understand that I ignore? Like, you know, 
there's been you know books now about the cargo container how the container is such a big thing for revolutionizing shipping we don't really think about it the wooden pallet that stuff gets put onto the mm. wooden pallet is how a forklift can go up and pick oh, something yeah. and move it across a warehouse yeah prior to those things it was crazy you know um that's a thing you know we have to sort of keep in mind when we think about you know hey how does this world work the other thing too is like i want to talk about one of my one of my critical thinking things people have to think about is one of the logist logical mistakes people make is how they assign agency and like to justin's point like oh the pentagon had that plan to invade china and it's like as you pointed out like yeah one person in one think tank whose job is to think out these scenarios thought this up that's what they needed to do but people think oh it's they have this dr strange love idea of the heads of the pentagon sitting together and going now oh, let's plan our invasion it's like there was a popular chain restaurant where some idiot who worked there said hey maybe because of uh you know our rising gas prices we could probably pay our employees less because they don't have much of an option oh yeah I saw and that. people are like oh this chain restaurants no this idiot there wrote a memo to somebody else and said this and, yeah. and the reason we know about it was because people there were horrified by this and said, look at this. But that becomes, look at how the, that'll be, you know, I guarantee you a year from now, some documentary, well, this chain restaurant was planning to do this to a, like, no, it's like no more than if, you know, the person who delivers your fries at McDonald's tells you to take a hike, then McDonald's Corporation tells me to take a hike. It's like, you know, where does agency come into play? Yeah, probably healthier. If you took a hike after McDonald's, That's that right. would be true. For us yeah. But well, you exactly. know what? You don't need too much agency to do. Uh, well, just be indoctrinated into uh, patreoncom <laughs> slash weird things That's because right. once you listen to the soothing sounds of my voice, you will go to a browser and type in patreoncom slash weird things. You will support us. I, I, this feels weird. You. Anyway, no, you you should and wake and wake and wake. <laughs> uh, uh, you can support us uh, right there, man. Uh, thank you guys so much for doing it. You go ahead and get access to our after things podcast before anybody else and make sure that no matter what uh we are here for you so head on over there right now patreon.com slash weird things so interesting thing and I, I, this sort of i had some topics to talk about but i think we should talk about this because it's kind of a i think it's a big story and maybe bigger than people may realize uh turns out twitter now has a new single largest shareholder yep a universally beloved figure on that platform. Oh, uh, uh, I know. Uh, uh, Chrissy Teigen. Uh, Chrissy, was it Chrissy yep. Teigen? Chrissy Teigen. Uh, she's always doing stuff. I don't know what of the, any of the stuff that she does, but she's always doing stuff. What is it? Uh, uh, I can't even think of any novelty Twitter accounts. <laughs> is, it the, is it Drill? Is it Drill? Is it at Drill? Did he write another book? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Mm. I'll bet you. It's Elon bet. Musk. Oh. So uh it is Elon it's Musk. It's sort of interesting how how people of large media empires go like uh uh Jeff Bezos says, Hey, uh, you know, I wanna the media is kind of big. I should probably buy something, you know, and so he goes out there and he buys Washington Post, mm -hmm. right. Carlos Slim, you know, one of the richest people in the world. He's like, hey, I think I'm going to buy a bit of what? Is it New York Times? Yes. Okay. And then you have uh, Lorena Powell Jobs. She's, you know, basically uh, inherits or because of, you know, the passing of Steve Jobs is in, you know, runs this big, huge trust, whatever, and, and not to diminish her own work. And she's done a wonderful philanthropic stuff. She goes off and she bought. Uh, she bought into one of the magazine conglomerates, was it Atlantic, right? I think, or yeah. something. Or yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes sort of a kind of I think that a thing that you see. Man, I don't like what's going on in the news today. What can I do? I'm gonna cancel my subscription. Or, or, or I'll. Uh, yeah, and let's let's uh, uh, media history moment. Uh, uh, rich people owning <laughs> media <laughs> entities is as old as time itself. Uh, uh, in fact, that that is effectively the model. Uh, the the you know, unlike a, a, a Two Faces monologue in the Batman movie, uh, <laughs> you tend to live to become somebody beloved. 
you know, like uh, 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 the Grams who ran the Washington Post before, uh, 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 what's his butt? Uh, yeah, Bezos, Bezos. Bezos bought it. Uh, were eventually beloved as being like stalwart stewards of getting getting the news out. So uh, this is this is not new. The the you know what what you want to keep an eye on is is how these things are being applied. But even if Bezos ran every day uh, uh, gigantic block headlines that were just like Amazon, the greatest deal in in anything history. Uh, it probably would not match up to like one tenth of some of the like influence peddling that yeah. that uh, uh, you know our 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 plutocrats of the past did with their media empires. So just everybody, I, yeah, keep that in mind. I I'll say this because it is. A, uh, I have two takes on Elon Musk. Number one, remember the main <laughs> uh, is uh, I. Uh, ever since Jack Dorsey left, uh, what, a few months ago, uh, the new person that they've installed uh, is seemingly keeping good on his word of making a lot of changes to Twitter very quickly, as fast as possible. Um, and what what would you say that he changed? Uh, uh, a, a lot of user interface things, making spaces more of a prominent thing. Um, uh, there's, a, there's some new use, user interface stuff that makes the Twitter app look a lot like, more like Facebook even. Um, uh, some of the communities that I don't understand, but I mean, I, I yeah. think, yeah, spaces, but, spaces probably has been the biggest, uh, thing that users actually like. Um, did he kill fleets? Uh, that on he didn't watch? kill fleets. That was Jack. That was before. Um, but, but you, you we're seeing more stuff of. Uh, le lesser lesser known features on Twitter like um, uh, uh, like the Twitter blue stuff and the ability to charge people to super follow you or whatever it's called on on Twitter um, to to kind of monetize that platform in certain ways or to uh, you know they have some ways where you can tell Twitter what type of account you are even if you're not verified like oh this is like a media account this is a this is like a podcast um, which I think is going to uh, in any case, I, I think that there's a lot of machinations going on. They, like Twitter is testing out a thing. Uh, Scott Johnson has one of these. They are testing a Discord or more like a Mastodon style community feature where uh, users of Twitter can join your community, like say the Frog Pants that's, community. That's public, right? Uh, I don't. It the the feature the feature is public, but it's not available for everybody. For everybody. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm in I'm in one of them for for Daily Tech News show. Yeah. And and so you, I have no idea what the point of it is. I have no clue. When it, it just gets to the point where like, okay, they're they're trying a lot of new stuff with Twitter. Twitter kind of wasn't working, still isn't working. So they're trying to find an, something new to take off, whether it's copying Discord or copying Substack or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know. We're talking about the acquisition or this this share purchase as if it were the New York Times, but the news doesn't get made on Twitter. Certainly news gets made out of Twitter, but the news gets spread yeah. on Twitter. Uh, I read the news on Twitter, but the but that's either have through other Have you heard stuff. of the word algorithm? The thing I always turn off on Twitter, yeah. No, well, you, 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 you may, but again, the little sidebar. So here's the thing. When you live in a world of as much content as out there as possible, you don't need to say it because somebody else said it. You just need to amplify it. And so Twitter, if you go look at that sidebar on the Twitter main page of what they're selecting, what's getting amplified, whatever, way more influential than it is the single most influential I, source I, of news on the planet. I, I don't disagree that it's influential, but I think it is different than buying the Washington Post. Well, it is. Uh, yes, it's better. Listen, the Washington Post, the Twitter banned the president. Twitter banned our former president. Twitter is able to remove an entire person from an entire point of conversation and notice the impact that had on that. Washington Post can run all the articles at once, only got a minimal impact. So, like, so much bigger, so much bigger. I mean, you had to be on his email list to find out he hit a hole in one. Uh, <laughs> uh, look. Um, but we don't know who won oh, the game. Here and, is, and you didn't he, want to brag. I'm sorry. My other take. You, are, yeah, do, do, do your take, and then I want to get into uh, uh, yeah. what, what King Media is. Uh, and my, my second take is that this is probably going to be a good thing for Twitter. 
like if either look i i'm i'm become i'm i'm a social media accelerationist i think we <laughs> i we have got a we've got a lot of platforms that are getting long in the tooth are getting confused about who they are and what they are and they're trying to be these do all service companies and so either he's going to make twitter really good really quickly or we're going to leave twitter for something better very soon and i think both of those are acceptable to me uh boy i would god another social media company that would stick although then again like i don't know tick TikTok came and went, and I was like, "Ah, it's for the youngs." And I, I just, I just want my exact age demographic to have another thing. All right, King Media. King Media. What is King Media? This was something that really only I think became a lot more traceable to the average person uh, in the internet era, where a there were a lot more layers, and b you saw them cascade a lot faster. But this is kind of the way that things have always worked in the history of media. You have King Media that reports a thing, right? And we can get into more nitty gritty on like how reporting, like the ideas that that start for reporting. But just to give you a basic primer, when I was a reporter, my editor would leave on my desk when I got, by the time I got there in the morning, either like stuff from like the obit section or from, from something else, just to be like, hey, follow up on this. Like he would go look for these things. He would find these little like whiffs of a story and then I would go uh, uh, find it. But, but that's, that's the general idea of how like local news at least is made. You have a report there, and then that goes out on the wire services or is also covered by the wire services that are then covered and then written about by smaller newspapers that are then covered by television stations that are then reported on by uh, radio. And the more that your media is citing other things the more you know it's not King Media, the more you know that it is somewhere down the chain. Now, we have been in situations personally where like with the, the, the Diamond Club book and stuff like that, where we've been fortunate enough to make news that we watched what happened when one thing covered it and then it cascaded down to like six or seven other uh, 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 blogs, right? Like we, we, we watched this be demonstrated. Right, At which if you know about fake news cycles and fake news funnels it's the exact same thing you're describing it is the news funnel right yeah. it's just that this is what happens when you know a, a a child can go down the slide and a piece of poop can go down the slide it's <laughs> the, the slide works the same way with gravity uh what twitter offers social media in general but i would say twitter mostly because reporters like twitter than they like more than they like facebook social proof so where before my editor would be putting an obit on my uh, on my yes. desk. Uh -huh. Now, not only do you have content being created, so literally I, I, on my way walking in here, and I have no idea if this is true, is amplified by a partisan thing, but it was a teacher who was uh, uh, came out to his kindergarten class in Florida this while there is a controversial political kind of things swirling around it, right? Mm. Heavy engagement. Takes flying all over the place. Big check marks that are weighing in on it. Right. That video, aggregated and posted from somewhere in the wilds of the internet, but finding the public square on Twitter, and then having the conversation that justifies for anybody that this is now a story means that the newspapers, the television stations, and everybody else follows the lead to go talk to that guy. Whenever you see a gigantic thing that goes viral on Twitter and you see in the comments, hi, I'm Dana from CNN. Uh, uh, can you please follow us so we can arrange a blah, blah, blah? Yeah. That means Twitter is king media. That means they are coming there because they know that there is social traction on a story and people are more likely to go in or to, to follow up with it because they have context for it. And it's not just something that they are coming up with by themselves and then reporting on. Now it certainly goes the other way. If the New York times has a story for which Twitter cares about, it will get spread there. But that to me is the worth uh, of, of, of Twitter specifically is that almost as an analytical tool. It's where journalism lives. It, it, it is. And the scary thing, too, is that the amount of control and editorial control, like, one is 
who you give a blue check to. Do you like what this person says? Give them a blue check. Don't like what this person says? I'm sorry, you don't meet our threshold. We saw right before the election, the Hunter Biden laptop story getting flagged. New York Post locked out of Twitter from sharing a story. Um, the reasons for that, they're many fold, but what we know is a thing that now has been verified to be completely true, what it really means, what the implications, something completely different, literally may have changed an election, may have changed an outcome of an election based on that. And some people might argue, well, that was good because it was that close to election day. Maybe there should be, maybe we shouldn't have these last minute inflammatory stories that can't be fact checked, whatever. There's going to be arguments on either side. But that story was stopped from disseminating in this platform. And that tells you literally it can change elections, which is fascinating. I mean, it's just, it should be, you know, uh, maybe scary depending on where you come from. But when you look at, uh, what I, I don't it's hard to sort of come up with a comparison to what this is like. Uh yeah. I, I mean I think I'm I'm getting tripped up a little bit just because this is very different from other traditional media buyouts, right? This is not uh, he buy, buys the Huffington Post and he gets oh, the what, CMS, but, yeah. but uh, we don't know what his impact yeah. will be. I mean he's he's Larger shareholder might get a board seat, but it doesn't mean he's going to just step into the offices today and tell everybody, like, no. listen, new plan. Uh, in fact, knowing Elon Musk, this may just be a very expensive hedge slash troll, right? <laughs> he's got his, the money sitting in his Robin Hood account, and he's like, well, I don't know, what do I do? That was by 7 Man, million shares Twitter. of Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, he's paying... He's paying Grimes surrogate on Venmo, and he's like, I don't know, I got a little left over. What if I just bought Twitter? But it's, yeah. Yeah, but it, and yeah, you know, so and and you know, in the chat, they're asking, you know, why do we think eleven percent means anything? And it doesn't. It's not controlling interest, but it is. It is it the is largest. A, I mean, I think that's the that largest is, single. That, that, person. that is the one thing that does disconnect is that when you look at it, it's like nine point eight, and you're like, oh, it's a souvenir. No, it, it's a lot because of the shares are very, very diffuse. And then the other thing that, and somebody who's smarter at business would be able to explain exactly what this means. But from my cursory reading on this earlier. Uh, Facebook, Google, and a few other gigantic tech companies have it written into their corporate bylaws that founders basically have outsized interest, and that can, that is irrevocable. Mm. Uh, Twitter does they, not, they, and that was the reason yeah. why Dorsey wound up getting run off. Mm. They create two tiers of stock. That was like in the Facebook plot point where Andrew, Andrew Garfield gets realizes that he was getting the inferior stock and not the stock that had the control and could actually revert anything to it. Uh, yeah, at 9.5%, whatever, he is a single largest individual shareholder, according to reports. That also means that when it comes to votes, you do not get, you know, your, your voting shares your, are not one person, one vote. It is number of shares per vote. So he controls 10% of all voting shares. So when it comes to approximately, so when it comes to making decisions on stuff, that is huge. You cannot ignore a shareholder like that. And... Yeah, and I, I mean, assume I, it gives him a board position. So yeah, and we'll we'll, we'll see how this goes. I, I, my guess is at minimum he wants to just be a specter that is sort of hovering around in case things that he doesn't like happens, and he can and he can then rattle cages, uh, or people yeah. have to think twice about. Well, I don't know. This guy who doesn't like these decisions we made uh, owns a an outsized portion, so maybe we should think twice about it. Uh, that's that's my my guess. I mean, but then again, you know, he he certainly has a, a seemingly infinite capacity to spin plates, uh, uh, considering what else he's done. So who knows? Well, maybe it, maybe he's like, yeah, this is this is what I want. I, I really, really believe that the fundamental health of the world is dependent on uh, a social media having more firm ground rules and people understanding instead of being able to mold it to exactly what you want, which means nobody gets what they want because everybody has a different idea of what they want, uh, that it is incumbent upon social media to say, nope, here are the rules. This is it. We we are yep. going to we are going to enforce what we enforce and, mm -hmm. and not what we don't. And and people will jump and yell and but, scream, but but you know that that is that yeah, is what well, it is. 
well, let, let's clarify this. So like somebody here says uh, companies ignore shareholders all the time. He bought some vanity. Companies do not tend to ignore people who own substantial stakes like 10% and the single largest shareholder because one, you have voting shares. You can control decisions and who you have input on who gets to be on board and make up. That board of directors can say, we need to fire our CEO. That board has power. That is not a board that is like some advisory board. That board under the poor, under the rules of the SEC exists for a purpose and has this. He has a percentage of that power. And as a shareholder, as this largest single shareholder, he can get other people to his side on stuff. I don't know what the point is for being able to get control of it, but it's often you don't have to have literally like 50% control of a 51% control of a stock to be able to make larger decisions on this. That's gets into a bigger thing. This is not a vanity purchase. You have a substantial input because also he can go to other people who have shares. He could say, hey, I, he may have enough shares to push for amendments to put out there and suggestions to be made that the company would have to follow if it got voted on. So, well, I mean, we, we, we don't, yes, he, it, it can be a lot of things. We do not know what it will be because we have no idea, you know, what, what he exactly wants to do about it. But what is important to point out is that because of the unique structure of Twitter, at least for other uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies, shareholders have already forced Jack out. Like it was shareholders and the board that made Jack come up with a succession plan and then made him follow through with it. Uh, like, so this, this has already happened in this company specifically. So maybe it is because of that, that he wants to get into it. But then again, it's like, uh, you know, to be totally honest, he's a man who understands the value of staying in the center of the spotlight. Maybe he bought it to stay in the center of the spotlight for, 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 for 48 hours. He's very rich. He's very media savvy. He, he does stick to his principles, at least in terms of what, what he wants to do. So uh, it, it could be any number of things from 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 my perspective, but I do think that in terms of the corporate element, at least when I've read, <laughs> this is a company that is more vulnerable to this than, let's say, Facebook or Google. It definitely, I I certainly feel like one of the most plausible uh, effects or 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 I don't know efforts uh, through this purchase is um, to make Elon Musk the Ashton Kutcher of Twitter for right now is every time like something comes to 70 show. Like what are we talking? Like 1 million Acorns? subscribers on, on, uh, on, on the service. Like uh, anytime there's an Elon Musk story or anytime there's a Twitter story, that's going to be one of the little purple links for the next couple of weeks is Twitter unrolls the new uh, tweets to the sequel to tweets. And of course, Elon <laughs> Musk. New just tweets. Bought, I, I know. Uh, and Elon <laughs> Musk just bought. Hey, did you see Elon Musk is a cool guy? Like I can absolutely see that this would be an attempt to be the cool guy or the hot now, ticket item on Twitter. Now, let me say again. We talk about Elon Musk in part because he's the dude who wanted to build a a greenhouse on Mars and live stream it, and and that the the process to that led him to building a rocket company. Uh, it is not beyond. He is not simply P.T. Barnum. You know, you might say he is not quite the the inventor or captain of industry that you might think he is. You and there is certainly an element of showmanship to the guy that calls his tunneling company the boring company and raises money by selling flamethrowers he certainly does know how to how, how, how to build the tip and and delight an audience but it would not shock me if for whatever reason he does decide to seriously rattle cages at twitter and this is not his last move right that he does try more more of 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 a corporate thing I think it is and, at, at the point right now, we simply don't know. And here's the thing, too. When it comes to a signal, him buying a 10% stake in Twitter sent the price up today 28%. 28%. A 28% jump in this. Now, this could be investors assuming that maybe he's going to keep throwing money at it until he has a controlling interest in it. Or it could mean that people think it's a positive sign that he's taking one, just the future, the positive sign that he believes in Twitter in a long-term value, or having his influence could be good. You know, it could be any one of those three or some of the having thought about it.
But that's a very, very interesting signal. Like literally his presence there made everybody else's share of Twitter worth 30% more. So we'll see. I, I think you know the, the, the biggest thing if we're going to read the Kremlinology on it is that this happens, it might have happened simultaneously with his uh, poll of his Twitter following, uh, asking whether or not Twitter adheres to free speech. Actually, uh, Bryce, could you read the, the wording on it? I don't want to butcher it. Yeah, uh, this was a poll he posted on Twitter. Uh, free speech is essential to a functioning democracy. Do you believe Twitter rigorously adheres to this principle? And 70% of voters said that they do not believe Twitter rigorously adheres to free speech. Which now, is the, the, the thing I love about that and just the general concept is that like the oldest lesson that that old old growth internet people like us really know is that no one likes the admins <laughs> the admins always suck it is it is always a popular a popular uh, uh, rallying cry to be like hey who sucks like the admin sucks uh that being said this is a website the likes of which i i do think has you know, to to undercount its cultural and political cachet is foolhardy. Like this is a unique thing. It is a unique beast. Um, mm -hmm. So, is there a greater responsibility to that? I mean, he he seems to want to put a bunch of money behind it. Uh, uh, I I don't know what his solution would be. I don't know, you know, what, what, uh, you know, if, mm. if there is, I know that my issue with social media in general is that when you don't, this is Twitter and Facebook specifically, when you don't have mods, you only have admins, then you remove your ability to make kind of local decisions on certain topics, certain communities, that can be more hemmed in versus others that can be a little bit more free form. And, and, and that shapes opinion. It's the reason why Reddit for various different people are various different websites effectively. For some people it is hell, right? For some people it's pornography. For some people it's the greatest expression that they could possibly want. Discord the same way. They are, they are greatly, they, they contain multitudes. Facebook and Twitter don't. They have kind of one size fits all rules for everything. And they are not particularly beholden to any kind of, uh, uh, you know, case history or, or uh, uh, past, past interaction. So, and may, maybe, maybe that is what, you know, he wants to bring more to it is like, Hey, everything needs to have a prescribed punishment and and these are the only things that go over the line and blah 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 maybe. well maybe but then also we've seen big social networks act uh in in the opposite way right like they they do not have any uh you know um uh, they don't have any charge that says you have to be the open forum. You have to be the debate hall for everything, mm -hmm. uh, which means that they, you tend to see through their moderation, maybe not always in the headline, but the day-to-day -day moderation of those sites is towards keeping people on there, is to not kicking people off unless they very much have to because – they make money when there are when there are people in cots, you know. They have to. Yep. That they, they they are in the business of getting people on the platform, not making the platform good. You know, it it is it's 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 not about making good time. It's about making a loud time. And uh, Twitter is is very is is very good for that. Well, let, let, let's also understand that Twitter makes money by page impressions it, ma it makes money on advertising it is an advertising company the point of twitter is that you have a lot of interaction on it which gives twitter more of an opportunity to slide and add in between you know all the different uh uh tweets that you are seeing so uh, uh yeah there is there is a a tremendous amount of traffic that is generated by eccentric loud uh, uh, oftentimes controversial voices. The question is exactly how you govern them and what is over the line, what isn't over the line. Uh, well, what, yeah. what, what, what Twitter has uniquely weaponized is 
the fact that uh, uh, there is a no win situation. I mean, like Jack Dorsey was so wrecked physically by the concept of being the king of Twitter that he just started like living in maggots. Like, yes. like this man, this man was spiritually and physically destroyed by the weight of, of having either you're defending somebody that you don't like, or you're being yelled at by your best friend. Like it is, it, it is a hell site. It is. Uh, uh, yeah. But then again, should it be anything else? And also like, is it serving me whatever, uh, you know, Bud Light Seltzer Lime Arita ad that uh, has paid for my demographic to see it. Yeah. Well, you know, the Lime Arita, you know, you get the taste of lime. But with, with the Rita. With the Rita twist. Which is great. Which is yeah. so good. It's, yeah. a, you know, two great tastes. It tastes Why, it, it's like Bud Light Seltzer Hard Soda. How many different things are we going to put into one name? As long Just, as it's low carb. As long as it's zero sugar. Yeah, zero sugar, low carb. So, prediction. Hmm. is does he just buying this 10 percent steak and that's it and then he's like cool i just want to have a voice in the room i got to make sure they hear from me because i'm going to be a noisy investor is this is a strategy for i mean it, the question i would have is like does he want to be to, to, like i don't i don't think he would be aiming to get 51 percent or a controlling interest in the company and i don't know that he's in the game to reinvent like i think twitter can be very cool because there there is a lot of potential in twitter I, I i do read a lot of news i i have found myself in like a reporter's thread where they basically just summarize the article that they posted it's like 12 threads it's what an amazing website an amazing website that these reporters give away the thing that they are being paid by another outlet to do on twitter it is the funniest thing when i was <laughs> when i was covering when i was on the trail and i'm at a I'm at a, 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 a rally and i'm in these pens i was gonna say trump rally but it was all of them right it was the bernie rallies the pete rallies blah blah blah, blah. You, you're in the pen and I'm sitting in the back and I'm recording something so I don't want to bother people. I look out and it is all laptops of people on Twitter going to the website for free to give people for free the content that another outlet has paid for them to be there for. Just, I mean, it, it, it shows you there is a cultural cachet here that just cannot be matched. Yeah. And like you, I think you can steer Twitter towards more of that. Like, I think that's meeting people where they are in a very functional way. Um, if I ran Twitter, that would be something I would look into, but uh, I don't. A news division? So, or like news practices. Figure out, may, treat, if, if Twitter's going to be the new wire, make it, make it the wire and figure out a way for people to get more of what they want on Twitter instead of, you know, going to YouTube, going to the Washington Post, whatever. Get Stringer Bell. I, I think what's the thing the to think about. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I was, the season two was better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sabaka man yourself, huh? I think that the thing to keep in mind too is that, like I said, the whole, hey, is he going to go for more because does he want a controlling interest is that Twitter's market cap right now is like $40 billion. $40 billion market cap. And he just bought up 10% of that. He dropped $4 billion to do that. If you look at his fluctuating net worth, where like a year ago, he was worth like $100 billion, then it went up, then it went down, went up, went down. If he decides to take, let's say, spin out Starlink and make Starlink a public company, I don't think he'll make SpaceX a public company because I think he really wants to control it. But Starlink is a steady growth business. You know it's going to be predictable, what it's going to do. It just has to keep doing the same thing that it's doing, putting up more satellites, increasing, increasing speed, et cetera. I have a, I have a feeling that we're going to see a Starlink spin out. If he spins out Starlink, mm -hmm. he's going to have a big payday. And even right now, he's worth, he's the richest man in the world. He's too, if he just wanted to buy Twitter tomorrow, he could do that. He would have to give up some shares of Tesla, whatever, which maybe he doesn't want to do, but he could certainly spin out Starlink and probably spin some shares on that, whatever he could own test. He could own Twitter outright and then decide to do what he wants with it. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my, my prediction is he wants to be the scary guy in the room. I think he, 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 he wants to factor into the thinking of Twitter that if they, if they were going to do something, watch out, think about Elon first. Yeah. Just 
think uh, you know it's it, it like like that meme like you know i agree i agree is there someone you didn't ask i don't Instead of jesus it's <laughs> elon and it's uh, uh somebody did not give consent and that was and that was Elon. so i that's what he wants because I, I i think he feels and this is from somebody that comes from the silicon valley system it's so funny to to watch you know, some of the coverage was like Elon Musk, who's been critical of Silicon Valley thing. It's like he's PayPal mafia. He's like, like, PayPal. Yeah, and look, and 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 there are cultural and political lines for which have been kind of drawn between a lot of this stuff and pop 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 right. But I think he feels that Twitter right now is in too insular a uh, a position. I think he he just bought four billion dollars worth of. Uh, 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 ideological diversity into the decisions that are made, and maybe, maybe if he if he feels that this is something that is too far gone, maybe he buys it. But I think for right now, uh, he wants to stand in the room, and whenever someone's making a decision, he loudly cracks his knuckles. Uh, 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 uh last my last thought on this: Jan Daniel J. Newman in our chat just said, "Why not just buy the employees that make Twitter good and make a better one and leave old Twitter to die?" <laughs> but it's like. I don't know if you've noticed, but every time someone has tried to launch a social network, it has flopped. It has not worked. It is it might whether... be the last thing I try to acquire from that company. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you know, except for four, Brett. Four, oh yeah, buy oh, by yeah. Brett, please. Uh, four billion dollars would buy a very fancy social network that will probably not work because there there is a huge there. I, I've talked about this a lot when it comes to. Uh, social media succession like we have very high expectations of what technology should do and so if your social media network doesn't have video well, and Twitter, apps it, and all these other things from day well, one it's tough to compete I, I would say it's even more basic than that that's the reason google plus failed you it's a network the mm -hmm. it's a network it's it's twitter's been around almost what, 15 years now like and that. so 15 years of networks of who to follow who to do all this and everybody trying to copy us and do like TikTok work because TikTok was something new. Your network didn't matter. All that mattered was an algorithm showing you something fun and cool. If you want to, and, build, he, and know, even that was built on Musically, right? It, it already yeah. it was it was a, a a boutique social network that had its own following that then was supercharged. Uh, yeah. So well, and then well, I mean. The Chinese version wasn't musically. They came to America and they was, bought yeah, yeah, musically yeah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do Yin, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, but it's... yeah, even then, or, or even Discord, right? Like Discord, I think is like the great new social network or one of the newer great social mm -hmm. networks, and it is relatively different than everything else. It is basically IRC, but that's not what Twitter or Facebook are. And I think it's great and. Uh, that's what we kind of need is something different, right? I, I think we didn't like Reddit because it was exactly what Dig used to be. It's because it was also the right time because Dig was going down and it was new stuff. Yeah, that there is an older internet. Oh man, we're just so crazy. <laughs> uh, there was there was there was an idea when when uh, uh, social media was young that everything was very tenuous, right? Because we had seen similar offerings that we did not really look at as like functionally all that different that would just swallow each other up like you know ever greater fish in in a in a metaphor or something uh what we found out is that once it reached a certain phase of maturity you really needed to differentiate yourself and we have seen through some people were listing there in the chat talk to parlor Talk to Getter, talk to Truth Social, yeah. right? Talk uh, to Peach. The idea, talk to Meerkat. Well, but but just no, just in those Everything. three specifically, yeah. political, ideological uh, protest of Twitter was not enough of a differentiator. Like, uh, people went there, they created accounts, and maybe there's an element uh, that is that is still there, but it's not the King Media. It's not the Hive. Mm. Hive is still on Twitter. That matters. Yeah, I there there there's always going to be room for something else. It just got to be different. And somebody brought up the comment that like the moderation feels uneven. I think that's that would be that would be I think that's one of the biggest criticisms against it. And it's it's the hard part is that um 
our founding fathers, in my opinion, were very wise in that we didn't put things. And that they were no, not on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that too. They although could you imagine Ben Franklin on Twitter? Oh, oh he'd be insane. lit. <laughs> um, there. Check me out. I'm in France. There. There. <laughs> The, it can feel <laughs> Franklin's it, in Paris. We we don't have we don't have hate speech laws in our country. And some people think that's bad. Some people think it's good. I kind of think it's good because hate speech is so subjective in how you define it. And other people are like, how can we not have this? Because in their head, they have a very clear idea of how they define what that is. In reality, it is a very spectrum. There are some things that are pretty odious that we can pretty much agree on. But then there are things that get in the the messy sort of middle, and that's part of the problem here is that anybody doing social media right now, you're being yelled at. You've got to police hate speech, but people don't understand. Like, no, like really, this is is you know, are Ukrainians saying, hey, you know, kill all the Russians that are in our country? Is that hate speech? Well, maybe, but is it you know, really good point of view if you're from Ukraine? Probably, and you get into these sort of extremes where you go, well, it's obvious. Like, was well, it by the same rule? I said that's one of the biggest problems that you know, Twitter as being trusted has to deal with. And I'm curious to see what happens uh, next. And the only thing, pedantic point, it's not that moderation. Moderation is not uneven on Twitter. Moderation is non-existent because they don't have moderators they only have administrators this is the whole hierarchy well, of yeah, the internet the whole hierarchy of the internet is that either you've got site-wide rules or you've got community-wide rules and they do not have community-wide rules because they don't have communities which is they have one website they have that that, that they are making the these these secret police decisions yeah. uh, uh, that are totally on uh, you don't you often don't know why you've been taken off you don't know what tweet took you off you don't know how long your ban has been and this is not solely to twitter this is including websites for which i don't want to disparage <laughs> for familial reasons that that we may or may not be streaming on right now right. they 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 make these you know uh, uh the, the, these decisions that come from on high that are unclear and i think that as we continue to evolve as an internet community there is a call out from the community that just wants to know, hey, what are the laws here? Not the terms of service that seem to be interpreted differently depending on how many people are yelling about them, but can I know the laws? Can I know, like, if I'm trying to ride the line, what is the line? Well, and, and you know, if you're a multi-million, multi-billion dollar company, you don't want to set the line. You don't want to be the one who draws the line in the sand first. No, they they want to follow. I mean, again, they want to, to they want to, to they want everybody on the platform. Yes. And they're going to do everything in their power to be as central and uh, you know uh, I don't know a good way to say it, but they're trying to, to have it be for everybody, re yeah. regardless well, of the quality they, of the they site. They banned a former they banned a former president, but ISIS was still on there, and you're like. How how does this? Yeah. <laughs> like, I agree. I, I, I mean, uh, yeah. Th I mean, we oh, know you agree that. With ISIS? Do you, Bryce? Really? I'm trying to agree with you. I'm more of a Muslim <laughs> Brotherhood man <laughs> myself. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, like uh, Twitter, by being an international company, has to like keep the Nazi stuff out of Twitter on Germany, and there's a there. Because yeah. that is a law. That's a law. That, that is a law, law yeah. in Germany that, yeah. Yeah. And that is not protected speech. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but it makes you go, hey, you've got a thing. You have a way of telling who the Nazis are. Do you want to? Do you want to do anything about the Nazis, maybe? And it's like that. And that's an old. That's an old complaint at this point. But like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody wants to be the rule maker. Want to do picks? Yeah. yeah let's do picks. Uh, I got to pick. Pick I it up. I have to look up how, what it's called again because it's a weird. Uh, th here we go. This is a Netflix anime that I did not think I would like. I watched the first episode, expecting that I would watch the first one, and I'd just watch the last episode and I'd figure out everything in between. And I was wrong. Uh, I watched this Netflix uh, show, Termae Romae Novae, or. Uh, which is uh, about a, a an ancient Roman uh, named Lucius, who uh, is an architect of 
bathhouses in in ancient Rome, in the golden age of bathhouses. And uh, every episode, just spoiler alert for every episode except the first episode, is the exact same. He runs up into a problem with building bathhouses. He enjoys a bathhouse and then usually falls under the water and is transported to usually modern day Japan where he steals their ideas of bathing and bathing culture and then brings it back to ancient Rome where his inventive and impossible new innovative ideas uh, bring success and beauty and pride to the bathing culture. Oh, that old cliche story. (laughs) <laughs> How uh, many times have we heard it? <laughs> oh, and but despite being extremely formulaic, the reason I kept watching it was because it's not an anime. It is an animated Discovery Channel show. Like uh, they show you, like they, this. This is as much about the engineering and enjoyment of these traditional bathhouses in both ancient Rome and Japan. And what connects them as it is yeah. a like like uh, a segment on the Today Show. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so much so that the the author of the manga that this is based off of, uh, the last four minutes of every episode are live action. There's a live action package with her going to different hot springs in Japan and learning about their different traditions and trying out different stuff. So it's very much a like travel magazine show more than some robot anime you know thing that might be in your head um i will say this too man i i have have not myself been to ancient rome but boy the modern day (laughs) japanese they love those onsens yeah oh they are big into them and and i watch this and i can't quite tell if this is like uh wish fulfillment you know, or maybe just like alternative history, because it's 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 stuff like oh, you know, uh, the rowdy foreigners came into my my bath, and what do I do? And then he goes to modern day Japan, and rowdy foreigners go into the bath, and what do they do? Oh, well, they point at the sign that has the pictures that say don't you know pictographs of the rules, and so he goes back to Rome, and they build stone tablets of the proper bathing procedure. I- when I lived in Japan, the hotel that I stayed at was actually on top of an onsen. And oh. so you'd go downstairs to go there. And uh, there were different rules for foreigners than for locals. Yeah. I will say that. Yeah. Uh, it's... Foreigner, you were told to cover up your <laughs> genitalia at uh. all times. Um, and so it, it, was, it was interesting in that, in that it was, it was a non-traditional anime experience. And I, uh, I rather... Sounds great. Yeah, and great. Uh, I would say the English dub is good. It makes the show as goofy as it needs to be, because if you take it seriously, you will maybe not have so much fun with it. <laughs> Japan, don't change. Japan, yeah, you, you're you're doing it. You're doing it good. You're just just, just doing you know, good. we're always yeah. doing it good. Yeah, so Can't that's it. To get back out there. Ter, ter, terumae romae nobuae, which is such a weird. Just uh, you'll find it on Netflix. T h e r m a e or my uh my pick is i finally finished our flag means death Ooh, and uh uh boy just you know just a good show hey fr- friends you want a good show just go ahead and, and get this good show in your life uh um uh, without going too far into it 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 goes there if you're halfway through the show and you're like, I wonder if it's going to go there. It does. It, it does. It does. It goes there. Uh, it doesn't sacrifice a lot of the fun stuff. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, some great moments without playing into how this comes into play. There is uh, an apparently real uh, 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 historical thing for which a pirate can renounce pirating. Mm, that's right. Uh, and uh, there is a very fun cutaway to the king of England, <laughs> like tr- you know, uh, 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 workshopping what the name of this thing should be. But that I've I've I've, I've thought about uh, since I saw it. So uh, the gags are really funny. The acting's really great. Um, you know, little little quibbles that that I might that I might have with with some of the the uh, uh, underpinned emotional elements of it, but. Oh, yeah? Uh, uh, I think he got the main character 
I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I, 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 I just, I just think some people got off a little. Um, uh, I see. Uh, uh, consider it. That being said, uh, uh, I, I very much liked it, and I'm very much looking forward to a season two. I love that cast. That cast is just great, and mm-hmm. and their guest stars. One of those shows where great every guest. guest star, you just know it's gonna, it, it's gonna knock it out of the park. Uh, including a, a great turn by by Will Arnett. Did well, you even not uh, my- realize it was Will Arnett? Wait. Calico Jack? Cal- uh, may- maybe I just don't remember it, but I should rewatch that. What? He was, oh, he, yeah. uh, he was Black- Blackbeard's friend that comes and, and uh, 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 stirs, stirs things up toward oh. the end of the season. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, it's a very good show. I it's very highly recommend it. Uh, one follow up and then one pick. One is mm. um, down to waiting for the last episode of Severance. Ah. Really, really, really dug this world building so far. Very, very much enjoy it. Um, I think it's like I think I know what it's about, but it's really great storytelling. Is about watching the characters try to figure out what it's about which is really cool. And if you're engaged with the characters, you know, you could know, well, this is what's going on. Doesn't matter for them. You know, like I would say versus like Westworld where the character's exploration of what was going on was kind of sort of slow and plotting. And, Mm. you know, you were, it wasn't as cool of a reveal where here you could sort of start with kind of knowing, like if I said, oh, I think this is what's going on. You'd be like, oh, cool. How is this going to impact them or whatever? So very much been enjoying it. Justin, you've been watching it? I've not, but I did listen to an interview with uh, Ben Stiller, who was talking about the, the the development of it, which apparently he read as a writing sample uh, for his production company that the, 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 the creator of it submitted it as his writing sample to get a, a job with Ben Stiller's production company. Wow. And he loved and it so much it. that, that uh, and he said he was, he was sold on it by the first few scenes before any of the larger conceit is revealed. He just really loved the dialogue of the, uh, uh, the, the office banter. Yeah. Uh, and, I, yeah. Yeah. My joke is that like at the surface, it's like, yeah, this is what Hollywood people think having a real job is like. Yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, like they, they're like, it's like, and they go into these buildings. They got to wear these things on their necks. Like everybody <laughs> has to wear the same one and tag it in. And like, it's insane. Uh, uh, also, apparently uh, they, he cast John Totoro and John Totoro uh, was very excited to do it. And uh, he's like, oh, have, have you, uh, uh, do you have a, somebody for this other role? And he's like, uh, yeah, we're looking at a few people. And he named off the people. And he's like, you know, Chris would be great. Oh, Talking about Christopher Walker. <laughs> wow. And he's like, oh, what a- <laughs> and he's like, like, sure. Yeah, Chris would be great. And Totoro called him and personally talked him into doing it. Wow. It's that- great. That inspired. relationship is so good. It's so good. Yeah. So good. Uh, my, my pick for a book is Arthur C. Clarke's Profiles of the Future. This was a book that he originally wrote in 1960, and then he followed it up 40 years later. And uh, I've just been enjoying it thoroughly. Did I mention this on the last podcast? I think you told I think you did. us about yeah, yeah, yeah. this, but I don't think it was a pick necessarily. Yeah, so this is my pick. Uh, I'm on the last chapter now. And that was like, I think I mentioned like, yeah, my favorite thing from there was his you know, experience. Yeah, I talked about the playing around with like a hovercraft, and the, the last time he ever drove anything was a hovercraft. But a lot of great, lot of great things reading listening to him talk in like the 1960s about like what if we could have these satellites like you talked about the problem with tv at that point was it had to use all these transmitters to get signal around Mm -hmm. and we weren't really connected but if we could put a satellite in geostationary or you know orbit we could be connected and you could have a satellite newspaper you know yeah you know you could have (laughs) satellite mail where you would go to an office and Uh write down a letter and give it to somebody and it'd be sent to the satellite and then sent to somebody else and it's like somebody else's secretary who would then relay it (laughs) he's very open about and following up where he was off where he was on and but you just what a wonderful thinker and it just gave me a thousand ideas it just i started just thinking about like technologies i have access to and started playing around with stuff so profiles of the future by arthur c clark highly recommend very nice gentlemen it's been weird (laughs) 
Un momento. All right, good stuff. Oh, wait, do, uh, before you walk away, do you have an out today, Andrew? Uh, 125. Okay, cool. All right, well, then we'll do some after things. I got a good, I got a good topic for after things. Today. Good topics. I'm going to share some Good topics techniques. only. Yeah. Uh, but well, that'll be in a few minutes, everybody. Is this We're on gonna... my approved playlist? I want to only banger topic. <laughs> That's right. Uh... Hey Justin, how's it going? Hey, what's up, dude? I uh, I'm working on a new playlist right now. I've already published it, published it a, a little bit, but I'm making a playlist of racing music. Oh, you're into the racing right now. That's you're right. into watching racing. You're That's into right. playing racing. Playing racing. Uh, I drive my car. Yep. In the speed limit usually. But you in your head. In my head, I'm, I'm out there. I'm, I'm hairpin. <laughs> Drifting. That's right. That's why you want to go to Japan. The cars are lighter there. <laughs> right. They drift. <laughs> they fly sometimes. <laughs> I was uh, God. <laughs> before it was cool to be a fan of Fast and Furious, <laughs> me and my roommate were just so obsessed with Tokyo, the Tokyo Drift trailer. Really? With just you know the 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 corn fed dumbass white boy comes to Japan with little little bow wows there. And oh right, little, little bow wow. Was little so bow wow. <laughs> How has he not secured that bag for... Oh, no. Is he in it? I think he's in it now. Is he? I think so. I'm going to so. Google this while you keep telling me. Um, But uh, uh, just... I forget who says it, but somebody says to the, the protagonist, uh, the cars are lighter here. They drift. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. He was in F9, and he will be in F10, part one. And yeah, I think he's... They, they, they oh, lumped, right. They brought him back. They lumped, they lumped a bunch of characters in that are like... Now, basically, like the Q, mm. I think he was with the group that sent Ludacris and Tyrese into space <laughs> in the last one. That's awesome. Good job, Bow Wow. Uh, uh, but yeah, they're they're like the kind of comic relief, like like you can't put a rocket on a car, man. I'm gonna put a rocket wherever I want. <laughs> All right, I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, apparently, he was the frog in the Masked Singer. <laughs> so shout out to Bow Wow. Hey, Andrew. I, uh, I'm i glad that you're watching. Oh, wait, I don't know if you're listening here, but hear me out. Uh, oh, good. Uh, I'm glad you're watching Severance. Severance is very fun. I uh, So the final episode of the season is Friday. I went back and rewatched the first couple of episodes over the weekend because I've gotten a bunch of other friends to start watching it. And with a mystery show, it's always good to go back and see, see things from the beginning and see, oh, what did, you know, what do you, uh, you know, what, what hints get popped up earlier like they mention the waffle party in the first episode mm -hmm. um but they don't hint at any of the stuff that it actually is there's a what a party the waffle party what is a party i love one of the things i love about the show is that it's in the world building you know it's talking this with my wife about how like when you look at you know how the characters all they know is that world and it's weird it's this world where you're supposed to be devoutly devoted to the people who created it yeah. all they know is the icons the imagery there all that the manual is the only book they get to read and then when they get some really garbage book to read it's better than the garbage they have to read and so they love it or they take you know heart from it which is i think one of the beautiful things in there is you know the you know the, the rick on who i think he's going to play a bigger role i just love that idea like what if world like literally world building as a storyline yeah absolutely and 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 like i don't know i i think it's partly because uh we just had raised by wolves get finished up and then i watched moon knight and the the moon the character whoever steven moon knight is the least inquisitive character i've ever seen <laughs> he cannot just say for one second what who are you and what's going on i oh, i'm so i'm very frustrated about moon knight it's a stupid show sorry Ooh, you've only seen how many episodes spice are out rice. one and Let's give it a chance this price is cannot contain his spice i'm just saying i yeah the price was mm. low <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to. You were very upset on Twitter. I saw your Twitter thread. I was thread. upset about it. I feel like, I like mysteries a lot. And I feel like you can tell a good mystery and not 
not just get stuck up on the initial premise. We don't need to spend 43 minutes of this like sleepwalking guy story just so that we can finally do the thing. It's just, it, I'm sorry it was too long to be a movie, but now it's too long for a TV show. So, I, what I like about um, Severance is mm. you get jump into the main, con it's ahead of you. Like, like you're, wait, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And you're putting it together and then it's like, well, well yeah, this is what's going to be like, oh, this, we got this, we got cool. this. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and like, this is, you know, really cool. And so I think that it's really good writing. We're writing that's way behind the audience or just goes off. Like, that's frustrating. It's like, that's mm -hmm. the thing that kind of drove me nuts about Legion and whatnot was like, keep Get moving it. ahead. Let's just do keep, it, yeah. Yeah, because exactly. your audience gets better. Once they understand the rules of how you tell the story, you've got it. Then you can just like, that was the, the best example as ever was Battlestar Galactica was the end of like what season one or whatever, where it just said like one year later. Season two or three two. yeah 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 so but it was like they did that big leap ahead and you're like yeah hey. oh and that was i remember going oh very and then they went back and did hey here's what happened in the meantime which okay but i'm like i just loved the idea of like let's just let's parties want movies can be great you know batman begins to dark night like oh it's a few years later what's yeah. going on in gotham well you ready? uh Thanks. yeah let's do let's do after things here i'm gonna count you in in three Two. I'm having audio problems. Oh. So it's all getting static right now. Oh, Hold I'm on. sorry. Uh, I don't know why oh, that yeah. happened. Okay, I'll, I'll catch you in again. Stop uh, ruining it, Bryce. <laughs> I'll catch you in again. Bryce, why did you shoot the static into his ears? And three. And I don't know if he can hear us. He's, two. He just took his things out. Oh, wait. Are, are you able to, to hear us? No, yeah. He just oh, took his earbuds okay. out. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I didn't, I, oh, what are you counting them in for? You can't even hear it. I, just, I need to make sure that I know what's going on. Uh, uh, now I don't know if he, if your mic works. Is your mic working? It works. Oh, here we ah, go. Oh, now we're good. Hello. Can are, are you able to hear us well? Good. Yeah. It was. I was getting okay. one audio or whatever. Oh, weird. Oh, good now. Okay. I'll catch you in for after things in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. <laughs> I was trying to one up you. I was trying to one up no, you. That's fine. Oh, that's not. It doesn't. It sounds it's, like a monster. It's a mystery, like Moon Knight. Oh, is the show Bryce, interesting? It's not. Do you have a topic? I did. Uh, over the past week or so, uh, I had stuff I needed to get done, and I've been having I've been having a little bit of motivation issues, and I have found two two things two two approaches that really seem to help me get all of the stuff i needed to get done uh uh one is this thing i saw on tiktok uh, a few weeks ago the idea of of the scary hour have you heard of the scary <laughs> hour i've heard I, of i've heard of sunday scaries but i have not heard of the scary hour all right andrew I I have a concept of my own that probably is very similar, but I'm curious to hear what huh. this is. So, yeah, so the idea is, hey, set aside an hour, whether you plan it or whether it's in the, 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 in the moment, put aside one hour, turn all your stuff off, and go and do all of the stuff you don't want to do, you don't like doing, you have all these reasons to not do. Go do your scary hour, and it's just an hour. It's just an hour, you will you will live one hour is not so much. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's not some hard and fast thing. You just set aside some time. I mean, it, it's, it's not even like really a technique. It's just a different way, I guess, to say, get started. Um, and so between that and which the, uh, the Pomodoro technique, which I've talked about before, which is, um, if you're not aware, it's an interval timer, where you work for 25 minutes and then you take a five minute break and then you do 25 on five off 25 on five off and then the last 25 uh on and then a 15 minute break and so or, and you can change the intervals and whatever but the idea of get started take a short break get started take a short break um and i really needed that <laughs> over the past week i really needed to have these tools at my at my disposal to say i have this thing done i know it's only going to take so long i and once i start on it 
I'm gonna be I'm gonna be gravy. I'm not even gonna be worried about. It. Like I started my stuff and I was like ignoring my pomodoros to go take a break because I was in the mood. I was like actually getting stuff done, which is a a, a great place where you want to be given where you start. Um, and so I thought that those were, uh, but the the mixture of having the conceptual idea of the scary hour plus the concrete structure of the pomodoro, um, as well as other te- you know I've got a to do list sort of thing and. The, you know the way you schedule your day is going to be different but having having all those tools available and knowing look you need to do this thing here are the tools figure out pick pick one and get it and and get it done uh and i think that was what i really needed this last week i have a thing when i get down to a time crunch and uh shared it with my wife and that is that when I'm dealing with a book deadline or something, and I've been doing a lot of procrastinating. I do a thing where I say the first two hours of every morning belong to that project. Mm. No social media, no email, no nothing. I get up. First two hours are going to be that, and you get things done so much faster. Like I get in that two hours, I get everything done that I probably wanted to get done in a day. I don't do it a lot because it takes a lot of like uh, willpower to do it, but I usually because I get things done. But when I don't. I just do that. Also, sometimes do even like last night. I had a several things I had to get done, both for my bo- a newest book and then something for work. And I didn't want it to slide into the week. I'm like, I just have enough stuff to do the week. And I was like, okay, well, I know I'm gonna screw around until this time. And come that time, I'm gonna go do this. It's on. Or, or I'll do like that. The technique of like, I'll say, okay, I will open the document that I have to do. I will read what I have to do. Then I'll go do something else. Then I'll come back and I'll do the first five pages of what I need to do. Then I'll do something else and then I'll come back and I'll break it up like that. And then I'll get into I'm like, ah, I don't want to do five pages. I'm going to do 50 pages. And I'll just like, I'll just get these done. And then the next yeah. thing you know, you're done. Yeah. I think that there, I mean, really what we're talking about is discipline, right? We're talking about uh, uh, different ways for which we can muster discipline and not uh, uh, allow it to be subsumed by the rest of the day. I have found myself in a situation recently where, uh, you know, trying to get World's Greatest Con season two out the door. There was another project that we were working on as a pitch that, mm. you know, uh, uh, I put time and effort into. But the reality of my day is that between my regular uh, uh, daily schedule, for which is hard coded and ingrained in my brain, yeah. and the fact that I knew that every extra second that I had, I had to be working on these things that were either coming out or needed to be out the door ASAP, Mm -hmm. uh, all my time was spoken for, which meant that I knew what I was doing every second of the day, but also meant that I was not scheduling out my day like I normally do. I I fell into a lot of bad habits Mm -hmm. of just allowing the day to become kind of just this catch-as-catch-can morass. And I, I, I think that that, for me among the things that I gained from the lockdown was a sense of being able to regiment my day and get a lot done and, Mm. and also be able to confidently offload certain uh, things from my brain by keeping them on like a to-do list that I wasn't afraid was just a graveyard for ideas that I was going to immediately forget. Uh, and I think that that's that's kind of what we're what we're what we're getting at is like okay so for you Bryce the the scary hour mm. of like all right I know that every day I'm gonna have to do this on one hand on the face of it it's really just saying I'm gonna be productive one hour a day the reality is that you wind up making healthier relationships with what you have to do mm-hmm. because you're contextualizing it not in the unknowable thing of like, oh my God, I have to go and like, I I have to register my car. Let's just even say that, right? Like I have to register my car. If it's just register your car in your brain, it's this. I can do that whenever. A, A, it's whenever, but B, you don't know what it actually is. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to Google how to register my car. Do I need to get stuff Do I need to go to some place? Do I need to find another thing? Does it need to be in a cashier's check for some dumb reason? Like, it's just this thing that winds up getting pushed further, 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 further. Whereas if you're saying, okay, my my, my scary hour for Tuesday is going to be registering my car, mm. then your brain inherently begins to think of, well, 
now let me just Google register my car on Monday so yeah. I can I can I can I can do this. I think demystifying problems is the real secret sauce to productivity. Um, it's the secret sauce to creating your goals. It's the secret sauce to to creativity. Like just boiling things down mm -hmm. to the easiest essence, and that was that's the the biggest thing that I learned when I was at my best with keeping a checklist of stuff I needed to do was that instead of looking at things that stayed on my board for too long and thinking I was a failure for not checking that box, if it was there for three days, it was now incumbent upon me to, change. to make it a simpler step. Yeah. Uh, you, and you know what? I run into that. I run into that right now on my to-do list. I've there's an, there's a, someone, someone sent in a very nice, emailed a great night with yeah. an idea for a game that is fantastic and I would love to respond to it and it's been on my uh, thing for like six weeks reply to the email ask the question of the thing you need to do and I just keep kicking it kicking it oh I'll, I'll get to that tomorrow and uh, you know the idea of like you know what is basically office hours you know yeah. uh, a, a and, that's, and it doesn't even need to be always at the same hour every day but the idea of I'm just going to sit down and do the little things. And once you start taking off those little things, then all of the normal productivity stuff that we talk about kicks off, right? You you're start small and you start rolling in. You get into the creative flow. Um, and then you need to like pull yourself away from stuff because you're getting so into it and you're, you're so uh, in deep. Um, and so just having having those, especially because I work from home a lot, you know, this this was a oh, thing that I need. It's easy to fall into the uh, fall, fall into the pit, man. Yeah. When you are when you're when you're working from working from home, uh, I think we all we all certainly know that. And, and you know, I think we all knew that before it was cool, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. before 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 all everybody was doing the Bart man. We were we, <laughs> we were trying to create our own uh, uh, reasons to to do it. Um and there, I, there was there was nothing like that adrenaline of knocking out a bunch of stuff like what that's it's just so it's 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 great that's the real reward that's what keeps you coming back is like oh when you just and you're like ah, I'm just gonna get one thing done and then you're, ah well while I'm here I'm just gonna get this. and then you're like, and you just like rip through all of it ah oh, it's so good a a couple techniques to help and it's you know. People reinforce the idea here, like taking breaks can be super helpful because your brain reaches that limit. Getting focused again can be really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you getting up and walking away from your desk can be great because physically you're moving yourself out of that space. Sometimes if your distraction is literally in that same space, then that can be a problem. Like I, I don't have uh, Apple, uh, the iMessages open anywhere on my desktop computer. It's never been opened. I don't do it. I certainly don't have Facebook. I do pop Twitter open from time to time, but literally I open it in a browser, I take a look at it, and when I'm done, I close it. And same with my email. I do all my email through my browser, and then I don't leave an inbox open that's gonna pop open and say, hey, look at me, I don't have notifications on, because I want to be able to focus when I need to focus. I talk about, you know, when I talk to people about writing, I talk about the idea of microfocus, the idea of like how to basically focus on something for a few minutes, get it done, switch to something else, then go back to the other thing. And it's a thing that people do. And if you look around, you'll see examples of this. I've been reading and looking at a lot of stuff on memory palaces and how memory experts are people who are some of these memory champions are able to do what they do. Side note, some of the most prolific people I've seen talking about like how to have an approved memory who've won some of these awards for best memory and memory competitions actually were people who were curious about it like two or three years ago or a few years before and then got into it including journalists there's one re you know one woman who wrote a great book about this there's another journalist who are like oh who are these people doing these memory feats and they ended up going into memory competitions which shows you anybody can learn these things but mm -hmm. when you watch people doing some of these memory feats you'll see them put on noise just these headphones that block out all the sound because they've got to sit there and you're like oh that's really essential. How do these championship people who've got to focus on memorize a deck of cards and like the record, do you know what the record is for memorizing a deck? Mm, 20 cards. Wait, it's no, probably I mean, the, the time. time. The amount of time. Oh, yeah, time 52, to get 52 cards, oh. Bryce. I feel like if it's a deck. That, well, yeah. I, 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 well, I mean, I, probably the Joker is in the, I don't know if they keep the uh, instructions in there. Right? Uh, you forgot the tally ho card. Uh, yeah. I'll say five you know the minutes. Record time? Five minutes. 
12 seconds. God, no way. 12 seconds is the record for somebody to remember. Wowza, zowza. Okay. The competitions, you see this, and, you, and the people have these methods which they're able to do that. And then you know, in these competitions, what they'll do is they don't remember a deck. They might remember like 50 decks of cards. It's incredible. So, But you'll see them put on the headphones, and that's how to focus. And so mm. I use my AirPods all the time. When it's time to write, I play my writing music, and I'm able to do that. Mm. Uh, if I need to read something for whatever, I have my iPad. I change my modality so that when I need to shift my focus back, it's easy for me to know this is the space where I create. Yeah. This is the space where I screw around. I've got a standing desk that I use for work. All I use for it. Mm -hmm. All I don't edit my books there. I don't do anything. It's all for stuff that I do relating to uh, where I work, by the way, which was named by Time Magazine Ooh. as one of the most oh, yeah. influential companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyhow, uh, anyhow. That's helpful. So think about if you want to get back to your focus, think about ways to do it. Somebody asked, what is your writing yeah. music genre? I use a lot of soundtracks and I'll use soundtracks yeah. with thrillers and mystery movies. Pro tip, sometimes really awful movies have great soundtracks because when they hired the composer, he didn't know it was going to suck. <laughs> and so he might be like, I never saw this. People said it was good. One rot to and one score. But like, well, the soundtrack's really good. Soundtrack's good. So, uh, this this is a story I've told before, but oh. back in the day when uh, Andrew was uh, uh, in in the in the the early days of his illustrious writing career, uh, the Andrew is a man of tremendous focus, and so he would be on Pandora at the time, playing like the Hans Zimmer station, where there'd just be all these great movie scores that were playing. Bum, 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 but uh, sometimes the algorithm would get weird, and there would be these very like. I would describe as serial killer music because it was like these very weird, like atonal, like <laughs> track 12 on the Halloween sound. Effects. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'd be coming because his office was upstairs. I'd be coming here so we could go to Arby's or whatever for lunch. <laughs> and it would just be him in, in this writing coma, like zone, like tapping, like, <laughs> Here, Justin, read my story yeah. from the first-person <laughs> point of view of a woman trying to hunt down a serial, a serial killer, killer who uses magic to fool people. Uh, Thank God you were a success, because otherwise, you know, that would be a really, a really sad story. Uh, uh, the, so a lot of the work that I do, I can't usually listen to music during it, when it was like video editing or what have you. Yeah. Oh, that but, sucks. It sucks with podcast editing. I would love to be able to kill time listening to podcasts or music. Uh, and uh, so I use, there's an app that I use. I think I've talked about it before when I've talked about the Pomodoro method, but uh, there's an app I use on the iPhone called Pommy, P-O-M-M-I-E. Um, it's a couple of bucks, but it's not like a subscription thing. And what I do is uh, I'll turn it on. I'll just leave my phone on. I've got a little wireless charger on my desk. Put it right there. I see it counting down. 20 minutes left. Twenty. And once you see that, you're like, okay, I kind of need to, I got to get, get going here. I only got 20 minutes. I got to feel like I get something done in this in this segment. Uh, uh, and I, I that was a, a tip I picked up, I believe, from, from Brant Hughes, who's one of our other editors here, um, was... If you have a if you have a countdown clock, boy, do you get <laughs> really motivated to get done. I, I will say I've got mixed feelings on on the larger religion of of of, of the Pomodoro uh, uh, thing because I think it it can I don't know for my money it's a little bit too restrictive. That being said, mm. I think that there is a tremendous worth in understanding what you can get done in twenty minutes. Absolutely, and that I think is something that is that is huge, huge, huge. And so whether or not it's that exact interval, if there's a magic number right. of, of of what it means, like uh, and, you yeah. just setting one of those goals that's longer than what you think of as a short time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but but not, not an hour and a half, day. not two day, not two hours, blah blah blah, yeah. like when you realize the true power of 25 minutes, like you, you, you become like, Oh, Oh yeah. This is all I got to do is turn it on. It's a very understandable sprint uh, that, that I'm just, mm -hmm. and, and really it comes down to three or four decisions to not open Twitter or not go to your email or not check your you, phone. And that's why leaving you, the phone on, sorry, Andrew, it's just like, that's why I leave the phone on is because 
I can't move away from the timer. The timer's looking at me. Hey, no, you can't go on Twitter. You need to do the timer. And- I and and back to what you said before uh, about understanding the task. Like so many times, I delay a thing, delay a thing, because like I have, I'll get notes back from my editor, and I have a wonderful editor, and. Ed will send me, I'll get this thing, here are the notes, and I'm panicking because I'm like, I just finished writing, like, I'm I'm literally a hack, and I literally don't do a second draft. I just, the moment I reach the end on the first draft, I send it off to the editor, yeah. uh, which means that it's going to be a disaster of grammatical mistakes, whatever. Yeah. Anyhow, and I, as soon as I get it back, I have this sort of anxiety because, like, I just got done with the book. I, I just don't want to have to deal with the book right now. I want to do anything else, but, but I... The, the way that I worked my way through was like, well, just read the editorial letter. Just read the description of what I need to do. Mm. And that just all of a sudden, if I do that, I'll be done within a day. Because it's just I, I that fear of what the task might be. And so often we have a fear of what it is or we have unrealistic expectations of what it's going to take. You know, we want to write a book like, ah, I got the energy to write a book. Cool. I'm a big believer. Got to have your plot. No, I'm going to figure it out. Uh, if your architect told you that, you, yeah, you, you tell them that was bad idea. You know, maybe you'll get the Winchester house eventually, but you're yeah. going to have to stop halfway through and tear everything down and redo it. And it's great for Stephen King because your storytelling so masterful along the way. People don't really care where the plot ends up. Mm-hmm. Interdimensional aliens. Oh. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but yeah, the, I don't know. So those are those are at least my uh, those, those got me but between that and these caffeine drinks that i drink but <laughs> have, have you guys ever have you guys that's ever tried oh, the, yeah rockstar man that's my thing because rockstar beverages i like guzzle those have you have either of you Maniacs. ever tried the whole memory memory palace technique i've not no no i haven't so for those of you that don't know and maybe if you watch this sherlock holmes version where he apparently they, has a seizure when he goes into his memory palace yeah they made it they made it a mutant power in sherlock yeah, yeah and it's it's if anything like oh geez so memory palace is an ancient technique that actually they found most ancient cultures have probably used this because in a pre-textual time how did you memorize stuff we just say oh we just memorized it well using different ways to do it The memory palace is the idea you take some environment or place you're familiar with, and then you place the things you need to remember remember, in your mind's eye where they are. Memory palaces could be based on something as simple as your house where you live in, and you walk through there and say, I'm going to place this on the table. This is over here. The Australian Aborigines, who have an oral history that goes back like 7,000 years and actually seems to have some pretty good, reliable climate, climate data about things that happened, they would create a memory palace along a 900 kilometer journey and create, wow. and that's how they would encode this stuff is when you get to here, this is what this means. And oh, wow. this is the brush here and this, all this. So it's an ancient technique. that's very, very useful. I was just, for some reason, actually the Arthur C. Clarke got something made me think about that. Cause he talked about the ability to compress time. Like if you could compress time, I'm like, man, we have these powerful language models, which can actually do some cool stuff with like, like they can create, rhymes and they can do really neat things with language and i was thinking about oh, i'd be cool let me do a little dive back into memory palaces and do that and it was sort of funny because i'm like ah let me let me try one and then i mean literally over the weekend like i remembered i i, I you know i could tell you i could tell you and this is on top of everything else i had to do this weekend like i flew in from florida got in at like you know early saturday morning slept did some stuff saturday and then did a bunch of work yesterday but also in between that managed to remember the 50 most populous countries in order of population hey. uh, oh. by and i figured for my memory palace i decided to use an ihop <laughs> and so <laughs> i thought international house of pancakes because yeah. i was also thinking about could i create a memory palace that i could share with other people that, that they could mem- remember from because if i mm. used either use something everybody knows what an ihop looks like well in you know America most or yeah. most people yeah yeah or like i could use a mcdonald's and i said oh that'd be and it was just fun because then i did that and last night i went to bed da, 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 da. i'm like all 50 like all and i'm gonna all keep uh-huh. adding to it but it's not that hard i did that like first of all, i'll do the 13 colonies you know oh then i'll do like eight greek philosophers and i'm like oh well i could do an ordered list and by order of population of you know countries and so uh wow. i did that what's so, the 50th uh 50th i got to was venezuela oh wow look at that look at that hey mm-hmm. shout out to venezuela yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so 
um, you know, yeah. uh, it's it's interesting because then you start to do it and vi- spatially you start to do it and then you just start to like you can remember it and it's a fun technique. It it is a fascinating idea to to pair those elements with spatial awareness and how much mm-hmm. we rely on spatial awareness and we don't even realize that that is something that is like a fundamental core element and and we don't realize how deep those roots go if we're able to assign these concepts to abject uh uh you know concepts there, it, there's and we're really that's how all the memory champions do it all of them do use memory palaces that is the method they use for it and so it's been again there may be some better method out there and some neuroscientists say that if you actually look at the brain, they say neurons will even form in sort of relational structures like this, which hmm. may be true, but maybe could be searching. But there's probably some conceptual thing to it because it does. We're really that is a really easy way to sort of memorize stuff. And there are other techniques too. There's PAO, which is person ad object, person action object. So if you have to remember things like numbers. You know, you might come up with your own, like, you know, one is Alice in Wonderland, you know, and then mm-hmm. an action, you know, putting on something and then it'd be sunglasses. And so you come up with, you memorize this list of, let's say, you could do a 10 digit one or 100 digit ones and these, and you could start to remember numbers, even large sequences. And they do these memory competitions. People will remember like pi to thousands of digits, thousands wow. of digits. And these are not people, generally speaking, who were born prodigies. These were normal people who learned these techniques. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Very fun thing. I'll probably follow up in a couple of weeks or something with some of the books I've, you know, read and some recommendations on that. Yeah, (laughs) memorize. Well, there's a way to memorize stuff. Like that was actually, uh, most of these memory people will tell you like, like they'll say like, yeah, here's how to remember your shopping list, but write down your shopping list. Why not just write it down? down. Yeah. Yeah, And they'll they'll be like, yeah, you could, you could, you could remember a book. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to do that, you know? And, but there is, but if you have to do, let's say script or dialogue, one of the techniques you can use for that is you take it, and I was using this for the Declaration of Independence because I was bored, is you take it and you go through, read it through. Then you just take the first letter of each word and the punctuation. And then you make that and you keep sort of like the line breaks or whatever on that. And then you go through there and see if you can remember it. And that will actually... You can go from there to there, and then all of a sudden recall it. So just wow. getting rid of the rest of the letters, except for the first letter, is a second is a next step. And so there are things like that you could do. Um, oh, people, you, uh, no. uh, I have one last pro tip, but uh, but it's yeah, please, separate no, from ahead. from uh, 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 what one of the other things that I'll do. We talked about kind of once you get started, you start building up momentum and you start checking stuff off. Uh, one of the things that I've started doing in my to-do list app is every day I, I have it put lunch and dinner on the to-do list because a, sometimes I forget to eat, uh, and B, it feels like you're pacing out the day. Like you've got stuff you're going to do. You're going to get, you're going to eat lunch and or dinner. So you're going to check those off eventually. And you're classifying the day a little more than daytime, nighttime, um, uh, and then those little, they, you know, then it feels like, okay, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go eat some lunch and have a shower. And then I've got to go do the thing because it's on my list. Um, and just little things like that. Like it's similar to the idea you, when you mentioning, like, just write down your shopping list. That like, that, that's what kicked me off on that. Uh, somebody mentioned in the comments. They said, I can't visualize that, that. And actually there is a, a YouTube channel by a guy who's a very interesting character Anthony Mativier, and he does tons of courses on uh, lots of great information about the history of memory palaces and memory techniques. He actually says that he has, comes and goes, that he has aphantasia. He has the inability to see things like other people do, and he's got a whole video on that. You might want to check that out because he talks about how do people who don't visualize like other people do, how are they able to do it? And he, you know, is a guy who's a memory expert, and he's like, yeah, my brain just doesn't do that the same way. Wow. So... Um, people uh, have been dealing with a lot of these things for a lot of times. So there are a lot of interesting solutions to that. So, yeah, wow. uh, there you go, Bryce. You're so you found it faster than I could. So, uh, you're amazing. Uh, there you go. Well, uh, I'll have that. We'll have that in the show notes as well. Yeah, Anthony yeah. Mativier. That'll be my pick. Uh, I'll see. I'll put his uh, Anthony Mativier's ch- uh, channel. His last name is spelled M E T I V I E R. He's got like he's called the magnetic memory method, uh, which you know. Kind of, you know, sounds like a very uh, uh, trademarky kind of thing, but he's he's really passionate about this and has a lot of interesting insights into it. So, 
and there's an interesting community too of people who talk to each other, et cetera. Very cool. Um, uh, yeah, my my uh, my pick is going to be Palmy. I talked about it earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only like four dollars. You can change the intervals. You can uh, have different profiles. If you, uh, what's nice is so. Uh, you can have it on the phone, on the iPhone, or the iPad, or the watch, and they can all be different timers and different profiles. So if you really want to go into it of like, okay, here I need a four-hour window of this phase and then the, and then also running a tighter one on your watch, you can do that. Um, uh, very much, uh, very, very recommended. I bought this a long time ago, and it still works, um, which uh, you don't see oop, as much in... Uh, in in apps and stuff because it, everyone wants to go to subscriptions but pommy p-o-m-m-i is uh if you've got an iphone or an ipad or a watch uh that's highly recommended from me uh my recommendation is the jury method a uh, method oh. that i use exclusively okay uh uh first things first buy yourself a regular ass whiteboard mm -hmm. uh, uh i would i would uh, uh put it up somewhere that you are close to every day uh, when you are at your best, which I'm not at right now. So do as I say, not as I do, but, uh, every day, write out your schedule as best as you know it, mm -hmm. uh, leave gaps. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, but everything that you have to do, put that in. If there's at that point, things that you immediately think, Oh, if I have a gap there, I should do then, then, uh, uh go ahead and, and fill that in. And then also update your to do's. So just put your general to do's. Uh, don't differentiate between the things that need to be get, get done tomorrow and the things that need to get done eventually. But like I said before, if something is on there for more than three days, break it up. Change break it, it up into yeah. another thing. Like, or even reword it. Sometimes you sometimes you wrote it weird and yeah it, I mean I I would say make it simpler that that's my 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 personal philosophy is like hmm. if uh uh I need to f fix my sprinkler in the backyard yeah right um if that sits there for three days change it to l search YouTube for fixing sprinkler mm, okay. like just the first thing that then gets you to write another thing, right? If you just take in that first step, it, it, it's, it, it, it's a, it's a different situation. There you go. All right. Well, uh, I think that's going to do it here for after things. Andrew had to, uh, run off to another call, but, uh, thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Justin, for sticking around. Thank you Andrew, yeah. for all your help. Uh, this has been the after things podcast. It's been after. <laughs> Hey, there we go. Oh, yeah. I, I unplugged my phone just to give this tip, and I didn't give it. But uh, you know one thing that I've done on my phone, Justin? What'd you do on your phone, Bryce? So instead of my home screen, you know, on the iPhone, you can rearrange your home screens. Yep. yep. Uh, my top home screen is just my to-do widget and my Pomodoro timer. And the idea being, when I pull up my phone, if I keep, because I'll just, because it's, Sometimes it wants to remember where you were. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. You just swipe when you're swiping a couple of times to get everything started. You're back here at your big to-do list. Yeah. And at the timer. Um, and uh, 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 I find that that is at least very intentional because the iPhone is very sticky about what screen it wants to bring you back to a lot of times. And you really don't think about it very much if you don't, if you aren't trying to hack it like this. Yeah. Uh, but just having that intentional moment, even even though you have like a page that can just be for widgets, having the thing that eventually you will default to swiping exactly to it, um, and those little bits of intentionality help you get stuff focused too. Man, you know, human brains, dude, they're weird. Everybody needs their own thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, all this kind of getting things done stuff, I've always found uh, when it was really hot in the, like, you know, late aughts, early tens, and you had all these like computer programs and stuff like that that were really, really popular. Mm -hmm. I always found them to be for people that just thought different. And like, you know, yeah, for some that's cool. Like yeah. if it works for your brain, it works for your brain. What works for my brain will not necessarily work for other people's brains. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of, you know, intelligence or whatever. It's just mm. what motivates you. Absolutely. Um, and knowing how to, 
Like first, it, know thyself. Yeah, it's. I believe that was Bart Simpson. <laughs> it's not cheating to know how to handle yourself. You know, yeah. Like sometimes your cognitive mind is not the full totality of your consciousness, and sometimes you need to know the how you trick yourself. Um, I don't know, because yeah. just like looking up the answer in the crossword puzzle, like you're not cheating, you're learning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, alrighty, everybody. Well, we are going to uh, to uh, go offline. Thank you so much for joining us for weird things and happening. Thanks, Justin, for sticking around. Hey, no problem, Bryce. Uh, it's always a pleasure. See you, friends, later. Absolutely. We'll be back in a couple hours with Cord Killers. We've got, oh, who do we have on the show today? Um, uh, someone great, I'm sure. Lamar Wilson, I believe. Hey. Lamar Wilson. So, everybody, tune in for that. We'll be back here a little later. Bye. See you.